I used to consider myself to be somebody who is not easily annoyed. I am amiable in most of my dealings, and I try not to take a lot of things to heart. But I recently found something that greatly tests that narrative. It is the sound of water leaking from a tap after I have closed it. That sound duh, 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 just grates my nerves, not only because it is an annoying, persistent noise in the background, but because to me it represents wastage. It is water leaking out of a tap, not being put to any good use, and simply going down the drain. But a leaking tap is easy to fix, right? You can simply close the tap properly, or if the problem persists, have a handyman look at it, and he will sort it out in a few minutes. But how do you fix the consistent leakage of skills within a key sector of society? I want you all to remember the number 29.1%. It is the percentage of women currently employed in science, both in part-time and full-time positions across the world. It is shockingly low, especially if you follow the trail from the beginning. The UNESCO Institute for Statistics did some research and they found that 53% of undergraduate science enrollments are female. That number rises slightly to 55% at master's level decreases to 44% at PhD because that's not everybody's cup of tea. But when you get into the workplace, only 29.1% are female in both part-time and full-time positions. So where are all the women? Where have they disappeared to and why are they leaking out of the science pipeline? These were questions I considered as I took a journey of reflection back to the beginning of my love affair with science. You see, as a young girl, science was a subject I was strongly encouraged to learn because my father would not let me rest. So at the time, he gave me all the best books he had on every science-based subject you could think of. So I learned everything from electricity to mechanics, chemistry, biology, I learned it. And because my father was the one who encouraged me, I sort of did not understand that my gender would play a role in whether or not I could be a successful scientist. I was in for many reality checks. My first reality check was during my undergraduate study. I was a microbiology student at wherever, <laughs> and I had been assigned to work on a project that had an element of process engineering in it. So I was assigned to work with a male postdoctoral candidate. The first day he took me around the laboratory and showed me how to assemble a bioreactor, he asked me a question that till this day I cannot get out of my head. Do you want to be successful, Demi? Or do you simply want to be married and have kids? See, up until that point, I had been so shielded from the reality women faced in science that I did not even know this was a choice that had to be made. I also did not understand why this was being presented to me as a choice because most of the professors I looked up to in the department were married with kids. What did not occur to me at the time was the fact that they were all male. So I shakily told him I wanted to be successful because it didn't seem like I had any other choice. I couldn't exactly stand there and say, oh, do you know why I'm here to learn how to assemble a bioreactor? It's because I wanted to churn out a husband for me. <laughs> so what followed was a gruesome introduction into what I was to expect if I was going to be his definition of a successful scientist. At the insistence of the supervisor, I was expected to be in the laboratory for 48 hours at a time three times a week. So if you do the math, in a week, I only had 24 hours to myself. At the end of the year, I discovered that it was actually an 18-hour study, which meant that I had an additional 30 hours piled on because somebody was trying to make my life hell. But I wasn't discouraged, you know. When you're a daddy's girl, you have this go-to attitude. Like, I can, I can keep pressing on, there's still a bit of it left in me. So I decided I'd do a master's in engineering. And I started to send out applications to professors, hoping they'd take me on as a student. One female professor was really enthusiastic about that. And in retrospect, that's the only opportunity I have ever had to work with a woman in science. Unfortunately, it was not to be. When she received a recommendation from my undergraduate supervisor, she declined my application. The letter stated that even though I had presented results that were good enough for publication, I was not dedicated enough. The letter also vilified me for taking a university approved three week holiday. This holiday, by the way, was mandatory for everyone at my level at that point. 
my female colleague did not have it any better. Her letter stated that while she's beautiful, she's just not suited for science. See, I told myself, okay, it's probably just this department, just the supervisor. But as I went through different levels in science education and in the workplace, I started to realize there is no way women will want to stay in this field without drastic intervention into what is currently the status quo. A female friend told me about how her boss would always complain about women being too emotional to work with. What this meant was that the women who worked with him were scared of expressing themselves because they did not want to be tagged too emotional. And that was a good strategy on his part. Because when he was going rogue on them, they could not say anything. Instead, they were going into the bathrooms to cry their eyes out. Another female friend towards the end of her master's degree cried in my car almost every morning. Her supervisor had asked her out on a date, and he had made insinuations that he wanted sexual favors from her. When she refused to give in to his demands, he banned her from using the equipment she needed to complete her study and kicked her out of her office. So she had to spend Christmas that year working in the laboratory because it was the only time she could get her work done without anyone around to tell on her. I myself have had my fair share of experiences. A supervisor called me into his office once and asked me to pick a man from the research group to marry, stating, and I quote, that single women are not stable people. It's interesting how the narrative changes, isn't it? At some point, I was being told I had to pick between being successful and being married. And then after attaining some level of success, I was being told, well, you have to pick a man to marry so that we can see you as a stable human being. I totally ignored him because I thought to myself, this can't be happening to me right now. But my lack of action in picking a husband spurred him to further action. He started to offer me as a prize to the men in the group during research meetings. Whoever gets to finish their research first will marry Demi. Everyone would laugh at that, but I never found it funny. I was there to do my work just like they were, yet I was being offered as a carrot to inspire them to reach their research goals faster. Nobody was actually asking about my research goals. That was quite interesting. So I decided I'd change supervisors. <laughs> and then I started to get threats. Do you want to graduate? They asked me. These were his friends, by the way. I was advised to play nice, otherwise I'd be stumped out flat beneath the elephant's feet. But I changed supervisors anyway, because at that point I told myself I had to stand for something. Now, you might think that women leave science for issues like work-life balance. And you'd be right. That is one of the valid issues women face. But you would also agree with me that there is a whole lot that goes on behind the curtain. Women leave science because we are tired of dealing with the deeply entrenched systemic bias that causes us to be seen as less than in this space. We are tired of narratives that say that we don't have the appetite for workload or the ability to deliver high-profile expectations, in spite of having women who have earned their PhDs, gone to space, helped build successful space programs, and millions of women who improve the lives of people through science today, we are still approached as though we do not belong and we are not enough. Women are tired of carrying the weight of misogyny on our backs, being told that, oh, you're so pretty, but you can't do science. We're tired of proving ourselves over and over again and still falling short, not because we are actually falling short, but because the gatekeepers continue to raise the bar for us while they keep it constant and, dare I say, lower it for our male counterparts. We're tired of being used to drive the narrative of women in science, told to smile for the camera so institutions can say we have a diverse space of women, when the truth is that we are excluded from the table of privilege and decision making in that same space. Not all women. I know that's a common thing these days. Not all people share your story, Demi. Some women are successful. And that's true. The UNESCO Institute of Statistics does say that of all science professors in the world, 5% or whopping 5% are women. It's amazing for gender parity, isn't it? But the question is, why don't those 5% bring in more women? <sighs> That's an interesting question to consider. Let's consider this from a game of chess and it would make a bit of sense. Now, if you play chess, you know that the whole point is to keep your king safe. 
If the king doesn't exist, then the game fails. That's the end. And the queen does this really well by being able to move across the board and take out any piece that is a threat to the king. But she also has to keep herself safe because when she's making those big moves, you don't see the king chasing after her saying, hey, hey, I got your back. So she's on her own while she protects the king. And interestingly, while losing the queen can increase the vulnerability to the king, he would rather sacrifice her if it averts a danger to him. Many women in this space of science are those queens. They are appointed to serve the interests of the kings. They don't do much to bring women into science because it threatens their own seats in science. They know that the gatekeepers will only let in so many women, so why would they try to bring in more women? When you play chess, how many queens are on each side of the board? Just one. Very typical of when you walk in science departments these days and you see that lone ranger, female, the one in the midst of all the boys. The seats that these women occupy are at least, at least on the condition that they play nice. And when I say play nice, I mean they have to be extra courteous to male colleagues, not have too many opinions, and not be firm on the few ones that they hold either. If they fail to play by these rules and come on too confidently, too sure, they can find in very unpleasant ways that they are easily replaceable by a more subservient queen wannabe. So think of a pawn becoming a queen. Or they are easily disposable, in which case they are sacrificed and the end case is just, oopsie. So these women fight to stay on these seats. They know it's not just about brilliance, it's about pledging allegiance to the establishment. They know that if they do not pledge that allegiance, they would be excluded, treated like outsiders. And in the process of pledging their allegiance, they start to echo fallacious sentiments against their own gender, because that's what is said in the corridors where they work. They themselves start to believe that women do not belong in science. Remember my colleague whose letter stated that she's beautiful but not suited for science? That letter was written by a female professor. These women believe that if they continue to valiantly defend the interests of the king, they might one day become kings themselves. But if you play chess, you know that never happens. A king would never leave his place for a queen. He would rather sacrifice her. So the question is what to do. If men don't want to bring women into science and women can't bring women into science, how should institutions approach this? The common approach these days is to strongly encourage women to apply for science positions. Some institutions even state in their job descriptions that these positions are for women. They're not doing women any favors. By stating that whoever the woman is who occupies that position, she will be viewed by the men in that space as a token of affirmative action. And that appointment will never be seen as a well-deserved one. Some institutions go to the extent of promoting women to executive positions without investing in their training. Not for the sake of those women though, for the sake of the institution so that they can say, we have 40% female at our executive level. But because these women have not been trained, they fail. So the delight of the men in their midst who are waiting to say women cannot run things, they ruin things. Some institutions offer money and I think that's great. Money is great guys. <laughs> I myself am a beneficiary of funding like that that helps me finish my PhD. But I argue that that is not a solution to the root cause of the problem. That is us mopping the floor while leaving the tap open. We need to close the tap. And how do we do that? Well, the first thing would be to start addressing the erroneous perception of ownership men have where science is concerned. The saying biology is destiny has been used in so many ways to enforce the narrative that men are naturally endowed to do science while women must prove themselves worthy. So what happens is that women are made to walk over landmines, do scientific cartwheels, and are put through unnecessary psychological gymnastics just so they can stay in science. Women are not even allowed to own the seats they have earned with their own brilliance confidently because they are busy trying to be part of the boys club. They can't even be themselves. So we need to dismantle that idea, that misogynistic and patriarchal sense of ownership that men have where science is concerned. We need to address the issues of condescension, intimidation, and harassment. 
I know many institutions act like those things don't happen, but the truth is that they do. And they're more common in science than you think. If men don't walk into a space in the lab and have a female supervisor say to them, nice butt, or looks like your lips are great for kissing, trust me when I say women don't want to hear that either. Women are there to do their work. They're not there to tantalize anyone's senses. They're not there to be teased and should not be treated as insignificant contributors to the field, whereby they're now offered as prize to men to inspire the men more. What about their own work? Institutions need to openly address that. There is a culture of harassment protection that is very prevalent in science. And we need to start acting like it is there and stop ignoring it like there's something in the background. It's not in the background, it's right at the forefront. Lastly, we need to start letting women be themselves in this space. A woman does not have to be unmarried and childless for her to be a successful scientist. That is a lie, who extends the same rules to men? When a man goes to pick his daughter from school at the end of the day, or even during lunchtime, is there anyone who says, ah, oh, he's so unproductive? Yet when a woman does it, all of a sudden, everybody's thinking about the productivity of the group. Oh yeah, has she even read in that report? She's probably speaking in baby language right now. Just because I'm there, I'm not there at that moment in time does not mean I'm not doing my work. Let's afford women the same privilege that we afford the men in this space. We are at a space now, at a time now rather, where we are all embracing this industrial revolution. And I argue that we cannot fully embrace it if 50% of our skills are leaking out of the pipeline. We need to have all hands on deck. And that includes every single person with bright and sparkly nail polish. Thank you. Thank you.